here to introduce the first speaker of, of this session, uh, who I have the privilege of working with um, d directly on a daily basis, and this is uh, Dr. Lori Clark. She's a clinical psychologist and clinical investigator with the Center for Healthy Active Living at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, where she works with an interdisciplinary team to help children, youth, and their families achieve their best health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark. shorter. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So, this is new. So, as Stasha said, I work at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa in a, a pediatric weight management program. It's not working? Oh, slide. Sorry. Okay. Yay. That's better. <laughs> Yay, okay. <laughs> I saw what happened last. I have nothing to disclose if you'd like to donate to <laughs> yeah, That's fine. I'd love it. Um, so I'm hoping in the next 20 minutes to give you a bit of an overview of an understanding between um, the interplay between mental and physical health, how this is going to impact our weight management approaches. Um, and explore ways to integrate mental health into our weight management strategies. So, lots of people will tell us that, you know, what's the issue? It's not rocket science. You just need to eat less and move more. Um, but, you know, I think it's a lot harder. So, with rockets, not that I'm a rocket scientist, um, you have useful formulas. You have pretty specific data on how uh, different materials behave in different conditions. You can calculate the trajectory fairly well, from what I understand. Um, and in pediatric obesity, we don't have these, this nice data. Mm -hmm. We have trajectories, but most of the growth curves that I've seen uh, don't follow those nice lines that are on the page. Um, and what we don't have is a formula or a computation to know how to change the trajectory. So. I have 15 minutes to convince you of where I think the evidence is pointing us in terms of weight management. I feel like a little bit like I'm on Dragon's Den here to give you my pitch. So let's say that weight management is like rocket science. Um, the purpose, so what's the purpose of rockets? I'm, I'm digressing here, but just bear with me. Um, <laughs> purpose of rockets. So the, you know, we send these things up into space. It's not to get it off the ground. It's to get it to someplace else, to Mars, um, to another galaxy. Um, and it's not the actual sort of rocket ship that we want to go someplace, right? It's, it's the passengers in there, either the astronauts or the data that's going to collect some, some neat information. Um, and so when I think about that, I think that our astronauts are our health behaviors, those things we typically think about when we think about weight management. So our sleep, our nutrition, how we move, how we cope with things. So those are the things we want to get to a certain place. But I think there's some other things we need to think about. And I think our milieu or our social determinants of health are that rocket ship. Those are the, our astronauts aren't getting anywhere if they don't have a nice protective case that's going to withstand the environment. So the, the rocket ship is actually our milieu of factors. And we're not going anywhere, we're not lifting off of Earth if we don't have fuel. And our fuel, I think, my pitch to you is that it's mental health. And we're not going anywhere. We can't get our astronauts to where we want them to be uh, unless we have good mental health. So I'm going to show you some numbers here, and these are from our clinic, and it is a um, tertiary care center for severe complex obesity. Um, but these are our numbers uh, in terms of mental health comorbidities. And as you can see, learning disorders, anxiety, ADHD, and developmental delay are our top four. What's surprising to us, we thought coming in that depression would be higher, but it's, it's not. And we're not the only people seeing these numbers. So when I look at the data um, and the research uh, that's available, um, we see that it, you know, the estimates are between one-third to 30 to 40 percent of youth who present for treatment also have a diagnosable mental health issue. So 
I th it's not something we can ignore. We don't ignore the, the physical health consequences uh, and comorbidities, so we can't ignore these either. Um, and the issue is, is that we, do, we know that they exist, we know that there's these comorbid conditions, but we don't really understand um, the, the full relationship. Um, if I look, I, I, you know, reviewing the, the literature, we see that there are some clear associations, and I use clear a little more to say, we have some more data that say it all is pointing in this direction. We still don't exactly know what the mechanism is. So for ADHD, um, we see a clear sort of bi-directional relationship in that those who have um, ADHD symptoms um, are more likely to uh, gain weight and those who are of, at a higher weight um, because of things like uh, obstructive sleep apnea are more likely to have um, symptoms of inattention. So. Um, and I'll get to, there's some neat literature recently um, by Polypot that tells us that um, there's some, some interesting mediating factors that go into this relationship. There's also a clear association bi-directional between body dissatisfaction and weight. So we know that people um, who are dissatisfied with their body, regardless of what their weight is, are more likely to gain weight. Um, and we know that the, one of the consequences of living at a higher weight in our weight-obsessed world uh, is that body dissatisfaction often co-occurs. We also see disordered eating practices, both ex uh, restrictive um, dietary restraint um, and um, dysregulated eating has um, a bi-directional uh, relationship with weight. What is not as clear, and I think which is surprising to, to many, is um, the data on depression and anxiety. So in some ways we see that some studies will say, yes, there is a relationship and others don't. And I think um, Shelley Russell Mayhew and colleagues did a nice review article in 2012 sort of looking at explaining why we don't see clear data in, in one direction. And it's because of these proposed mediating factors. Um, Weight-based stigma and bullying, which I'll talk about in a second, um, really uh, interacts with weight to predict um, anxiety and depressive symptoms, and this preoccupation with weight and shape. So there's some nice evidence to say that it actually doesn't matter what your weight is, but if you perceive yourself as being overweight, that's what links you, that's what is more likely to lead to um, higher symptoms of depression and anxiety. And then with ADHD, there's a nice um, article that came out this year around uh, when they look at meta-analyses and large data sets looking at there's some shared risk factors um, for both ADHD and obesity that seem to sort of set off um, genetic predispositions. And so what we see is that um, two things that came out after they controlled for a whole host of um, socioeconomic status, uh, pre, uh, parent ADHD diagnoses, maternal smoking, uh, weight at birth, is that we see that um, both parents' educational attainment um, and mental health really come out as, as factors that, that both seem to precipitate both mental health and obesity later in life. So, what are we going to do? So I, I talked about these mediating factors. I just wanted to mention that, I, that teasing and bullying in adolescence, um, being overweight, uh, and weight-based teasing is the number one reason that kids are being targeted. Um, and it's, I don't think it's, I often hear parents say that, you know, teasing is just a part of life. It's not. It's changed. You're not safe when you go home anymore because of social media. And, it, and it's socially almost acceptable to still make weight-based jokes and teasing. And so I think we need to keep this in mind um, because many of our patients have experienced it. And it really does seem to, to be one of those mediating factors between mental health and weight. We also know that body esteem and BMI, there's a clear relationship here in that those who are of a higher weights have lower body esteem, um, independent of age and gender. And youth with obesity demonstrate higher levels of depression in, uh, in this study as compared to their normal weight, weight youth. Um, and that this also predicts um, how these kids are eating. So again, if we're just going for those astronauts, those health behaviors, and we're not thinking about body esteem and body dissatisfaction, I'm, I would 
think I'm suggesting that, that that's one of those links that is going to impact weight management. If, you, if we can't help kids feel good about the body they're in um, and be okay with that, uh, if they're dissatisfied, then we're not going to get anywhere moving them away from really restrictive dieting practices. So when we think about how does this affect our treatment and our weight management approaches, um, and I think it in a few ways. So at, at the very individual level, we need to think of the mental health symptoms that are going to get in the way of our weight management strategies. Um, with ADHD, the hallmarks of ADHD, impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. So inattention and impulsivity inf impact our food choices, um, impact whether or not we're organized to bring our lunch to school, we remembered our clothes for gym class, all of those sorts of things. Um, if we think about disordered eating in and of itself, loss of control over eating and emotional eating will need to be targets of our weight management approaches. Uh, and if we think about things like depression, um, difficulties with self-care, I think we all know that we can't suggest that a child go out and try soccer if they can't get out of bed in the morning because of their mood. Um, and it, it depression also impacts um, uh, our appetite and, and regula uh, sleep regulation. So I didn't put anxiety up here, I just gave a few examples, but anxiety would be the same. If kids, our kids have social anxiety, it makes it very difficult for them to, to go out and try the things that we're asking them to do in weight management. So there's the symptom level, and then we need to think about the overall having, what does having a mental health issue um, do in terms of one's ability to engage in treatment, um, and both at a client level and at their family level. So uh, I think we need to remember that timing is important. Often for us, we find that when our patients do have untreated mental health issues, the first step in weight management is actually getting them linked up to a mental health service so that they can, they can begin to manage their mental health issues, because um, we just don't get traction otherwise. And then the load on the family. So at the family level, what's the family dealing with? What's the, you know, that rocket ship? What's their milieu? If, if they're already taking a, a child with severe mental health issues to a number of appointments a week, managing medications, trying to do what those treatment providers are saying, to add in another expectation may be too much at times. So we need to think about the timing of our interventions. So in Ottawa at CHEO, we take a, a more holistic approach and we use the five A's of pediatric weight management, which we, we did not steal, we borrowed and adapted <laughs> from the adult world. We don't have a lot of our own ideas, we just borrow and uh, adjust. <laughs> um, so we, we, we think about the four M's of, of pediatric obesity and we know that the mechanical and metabolic comorbidities, we need to, to really be thinking about those, but we don't get anywhere with these two middle M's unless we think about the mental health and milieu factors. And it's not to say that, that as a clinician or as a program, you're gonna treat all of these, but you just need to be aware of them uh, in helping to sort of move families through in a way that makes sense. So the good news, we have the, and my colleague didn't understand my picture here, but it's really killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> I thought it was ingenious, but no one else is on, <laughs> on my wavelength here. So we, and, and my, my argument is if we do this really well, we can ask for money from mental health services because we're treating their, their, their group as well. So there are common approaches to both weight management and mental health care. And those are using our motivational interviewing skills, cognitive behavioral therapy and behavior therapy, um, and the family involvement. We know it's key for weight management in pediatrics, um, and, but the same things apply to the treatment of anxiety and depression is that we know things like family meals go a long way in terms of decreasing uh, risk for, for mental health issues. Um, and the health behaviors that we're pushing, our little astronauts, they are, the same things that help with mental health issues. So sleep regulation, in physical activity. We talk about you know the main um, the reason to do physical activity is to connect with other people and to improve mood uh, and improve sleep. Uh, Self-care, hygiene, regular nutrition, these are all part and parcel of, of uh, treatment for depression. And social connectedness, we know that 
that screen time uh, is a high screen time is a risk factor for both uh, weight gain and for depression and anxiety. So we want to help our families sort of focus on these. So the things we're already doing, we need to keep doing, but we need to also think a little bit about the barriers and add the, make sure we, we're aware of those in our programs. So we need to think about the, the, the level of self-esteem and body esteem in our patients. Uh, and we need to think about removing the barriers around um, the social determinants of health um, and what the family's dealing with. Um, and then at a higher level, we need to really be advocates for um, um, decreasing weight bias and, and teasing. Um, and I think it, it's maybe above and beyond our day-to-day -day, um, activities as clinicians uh, or researchers, but it, it, we're the only ones who are going to do it. Um, so it's sort of left up to us. How am I doing for time? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the take home is I think that we need to cast a wide net when we're looking at the health of our patients and that needs to include mental health, both diagnoses and things like body dissatisfaction and body esteem. We need to um, consider that, that working on these issues is integral and part of weight management, it's not a separate thing. Um, we need to consider our messaging around weight and health. We found that talking and teaching about weight science allows families to understand why we're not doing a restrictive dieting approach, why it is difficult to lose weight, um, so that they're not frustrated with the process um, and that they understand what, what we're working with in terms of our, our biology. Um, we need to make sure that within our clinics and within our institutions, we're creating uh, stigma-free messaging and providing an accepting place. And that accepting place includes realizing that people with mental health issues, kids facing mental health issues, are, are not going to be able to engage maybe in our weight management programs the way those without mental health issues are. So, and we need to... to welcome them and maybe it's just keeping the relationship until their mental health has stabilized and then they can engage more in our programming. I'm on time, I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have two minutes uh, for questions for Dr. Sark if anybody has any. Oh, sorry, and applause, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Silence means I've sold them all on this idea. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So our, our next speaker is Dr. Rena LaFrance. Uh, she's going to speak to us about the Alberta Pediatric Obesity Strategy. She's the lead physician of the Pediatric Center for Weight and Health at the, oh, I'm going to not say this right, Miss Misericordia. <laughs> Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. She is also the medical director for pediatric chronic disease province-wide services in the primary health care portfolio for Alberta Health Services. Please join me in welcoming Dr. LaFront. Hi everyone. I'm just gonna give me one second to try to find the presentation here. I should be good. Okay, thank you everybody and a, a very big thanks to the Canadian Obesity Network for having me here today. So what I'm talking about today is what we're up to in Alberta um, and in specifically in Edmonton, a little bit about our strategy in uh, Alberta for pediatric obesity. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare um, and no commercial interests. So I'll talk to you a little bit uh, about the background of what we are doing in Alberta. So in 2012, Alberta Health Services launched an obesity initiative. As part of that initiative, there was a pediatric component. So we had a two-day summit, two-day meeting, where Sarah Barlow from uh, Baylor in Texas came up to talk to us about the American Consensus Guidelines, and we built our strategy off of those guidelines. 
I got involved in accepting my position as medical director in 2012, and we shifted from getting the patient to the least intensive service to the right patient at the right place at the right time. We also established a pediatric advisory committee, which we had um, in some form prior to the 2012, um, but it really became formed uh, after 2012 to advise us and basically help us to steer where we were going. We also created um, this lovely document, which is the Alberta Pediatric Obesity Strategy, and it's not a complicated strategy. It spans from prevention all the way to specialty care. Prevention in our province is primarily public health, um, but we do have some uh, programming offered, which is MEND, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then we moved to primary care, where we had come up with consensus um, healthy messaging. Some of the primary care networks, where are the, which are the physician basically owned and run um, family medicine practices, um, which huge catchment areas and a large number of clinics. Some of them have multidisciplinary teams, um, and we support those um, centrally through the provincial um, team. And then we also have outpatient dietitian counseling, which are um, specialized dietitians that provide um, support to families if they get a referral from a nurse practitioner or a family physician. And then our specialty clinics. So the way that things work is that the child or the family goes to their primary health care provider, so their family doctor, nurse practitioner. They get assessed. The child, um, the family talk to the physician or the nurse practitioner about where they want to go, what stage of change they're in, what their root causes might be, how many comorbidities, and then that directs them to what level of care they would, would go. We have a centralized referral form for outpatient dietitian counseling and for our specialty clinics. So it goes to one place and then from there it is sent to the appropriate clinic in the appropriate city. So this is the way our services look right now. We have uh, five zones in Alberta, North, South, Central, and Edmonton and Calgary. And uh, as you can see, there's not uniform services offered throughout the province. So the big cities, Calgary and Edmonton, have the most services. They have the full range. We're also running our programming uh, called MEND in, um, in three of the zones right now, but Edmonton doesn't have it running yet. And then we have our dietitians are throughout the province. So for the very rural areas like North Zone, which is... Um, basically almost everything above Edmonton. They have specific challenges with um, having um, staff to be able to deliver services. Their geography is a bit challenging. It's very cold up there and very isolating um, at times during the year. And so getting services to those families is a little bit more challenging. So we're trying to work with them within the big cities to be able to do things like telehealth and link to them to be able to provide them services. This is a little bit more about our outpatient dietitian counseling. So they take um, ages 2 to 17, BMI above the 85th percentile. And these are registered dietitians who have a little bit extra training in physical activity, sleep hygiene, and sedentary time. So, and they support um, the family physician or nurse practitioner um, basically in, in, in tandem. Our specialty care, um, we have three specialty care clinics, the Pediatric Centers for Weight and Health. In Edmonton, we have two one at the Misericordia, and one uh, which is the scholarly program at the Edmonton General, which uh, Dr. Ball leads, he'll be talking to you next. Um, again, we take from 2 to 17, above the 85th, and it's a multi-D, inter-D team. Physicians, so pediatrics, psychiatry, which is my specialty, um, nurses, dietitians, exercise specialists, uh, mental health workers, social workers, coordinators, um, and of course our extremely important uh, unit clerk. The other program I want to talk to you a little bit about is what we're running in Alberta, which is a program called MEND. It has three age ranges, 2 to 4, 5 to 7, and 7 to 13, nicely labeled. Um, 2 to 4 is a primary prevention program, so it, the, the little ones can be um, any BMI or any percentile, sorry. And um, 5 to 7 and 7 to 13, we look at uh, children above the 85th. So why did we pick this program and what, what is so special about it? So this program has um, a very good um, evidence-based um, proven health outcome um, track record. It's multi-component. So a family, um, so the child is re uh, can uh, self-refer or be, uh, be referred by a physician or a nurse or a dietitian or a public health nurse. And when you go to the program, which is usually a 10-week program, the whole family goes through. So both parents can go through, any siblings can go through. So basically we're treating a family unit when we do this. Um, it's delivered in community settings, so families that maybe have a little bit, um, a bit more vulnerable or have a little bit more difficulty getting to a hospital setting or to a specialty clinic can have services delivered right where they live. We work with um, Healthy Weight Partnership, which is the licensing group that uh, delivers MEND in North America, 
um, to make sure that we have ongoing evaluation. They have their own evaluation database, so we're tracking what, what they have tracked around the world. This program is a UK-based program, and it's been run in, in the United States, in Canada, and in Europe. And because um, it's a package program, um, it is scalable and replicable, so we were able to, to move it around. So this is just a little bit more about the MEND evidence. You can see at the bottom there, you can go if you want to look a little bit more at the research, but they've got 38 plus, I think it's 40 published peer-reviewed articles and abstracts. Um, and we have data on the 7 to 13 program, two and a half years out, that two-thirds of the kids um, maintain their BMI um, change. So there, it's a sustainable program, families love it. We, the, the attrition rate is less than 5%. Um, families stay in it, and two-thirds of those, those families and those kids appear to maintain those changes in the medium term. So MEND right now in Alberta is being run um, in Central Zone, in Calgary uh, Zone, and in Edmonton Zone, but not in Edmonton and Strathcona County, which is Sherwood Park, which is one of our um, little cities that are attached to Edmonton. So we are in tight financial times right now in Alberta. I'm sure you guys know we're in recession here. To get more money to fund programs like this is extremely difficult when we're trying to manage all the acute care needs. So right now the budget for this program in a $20 billion total budget is $431,000. And we're trying to reach a large number of children um, through every level of care. So those are the numbers in Alberta. This is an estimated number of the number of children with overweight and obesity. Over 256,000 kids and in Edmonton alone 76,000 plus kids. So you can see what we're up against. Not all of those kids are going to require um, care or specialized services, but really that needs to be determined by their family doctor. Um, but there's a lot. So right now what we've invested into MEND is $4.4 million. We ran a pilot through our public health arm um, from about 2011 to 2013 um, and developed um, an evaluation and an executive uh, um, summary which said that we should be scaling this program up across the province. So this, sorry, this, this model is what we're doing right now in the zones that we are running. So AHS is us, the health region, HWP is MEND, and then we're having specific service delivery agencies deliver the program. And so, um, what we're, but what we're trying to move to is a partnership within the community. So right now in Alberta, within the, the provincial government, they want to move some of the care that's happening within hospitals back into the community. So this is sort of an initiative that's just recently been developed. And so what we're hoping to do is find partners that are going to help us to fund um, programming, this particular program, as well as in-kind partners. So, um, last summer I attended a um, workshop where we were looking to grid the downtown for Edmonton with bike lanes that are protected. Um, when I went to that meeting, I met City Councilor Michael Walters, who's an extremely passionate Edmontonian. He's a community organizer before he became a City Councilor, published works by the homeless to give them a voice, a really good person. So I went to him and said, you know, we've got programming, we're trying to move to health and wellness, we're trying to prevent all of these diseases, and we don't have enough um, of a reach within Edmonton. We have no programming in Edmonton. Um, subsequent to that, the mayor's office got involved, so the mayor's chief of staff, which is Ryan Kelly, um, who is the mayor's proxy, and um, through my political connections, we had um, the ability, I had the ability to go with my team to meet people one-on-one, -on -one, to talk to them about providing community supports, to uh, work with us within healthcare to try to provide health and wellness par partnerships. So this is the result of that. On January 30th, we had a meeting with all of the people that you see up there. So our mayor, Don Iveson, who, um, I don't know if you know anything about him, but he's a bit of a rock star in Edmonton um, and competes with Mayor Nenshi. So we're not quite there yet, but yeah. So um, he, he was instrumental. Marty Enochson, who shared his story yesterday, shared that story with us during the group. Um, and so he was very, um, uh, again, instrumental as a, a patient advocate for someone who's been through childhood with this kind of, um, these kinds of um, comorbidities and, and this disease process. We also had our primary care networks, which are our family doctors and nurse practitioners and, and the, the clinics that are attached to them. We had the Edmonton Oilers. Um, so the Oilers have just let us know that they may let us use Rogers Place, which is our arena, our new arena, um, to run um, programming out of and to help us, um, some of the players will also be, be helping us out. Um, the Alberta Medical Association um, has come to speak with us 
and we're going to be um, talking to the, the sections of pediatrics, of psychiatry, of family medicine, and internal medicine to reach all those physicians that might not be networked um, to us right now with an AHS. We had six charities there, the Boys and Girls Club, our five collaborative, which is our five big charities within Edmonton, our um, Stollery Family Foundation, so, so a number of charities. Santec is helping us out as well, which is a multi-billion dollar company with headquarters in Edmonton, um, looking at also um, their ties to the Edmonton Oilers Community Foundation to try to get some funding through there. Our provincial government was there, our MLA David Shepard, and since this has happened, it's gone to our Premier and our Minister of Health um, through, through the, the MLA um, to talk about whether or not they want to look at funding and, and, and being a part of this. So they actually approached us to be at the next meeting for, um, to be at the table. We've had, uh, we had one of our local um, professional athletes help us, who's tied to the Edmonton Eskimos, um, as well as himself was an international high jumper. Um, the public schools were there, so Edmonton Public was there. Um, so the school board and Ever Active and Apple, which are our primary prevention programs in the school, and we're looking at ways to piggyback onto their infrastructure where they're providing care to everybody um, to look at this sort of secondary prevention, which is what this program delivers. Alberta Blue Cross was there as well, and they're very keen um, because they've got a number of claimants and want to, in the next 30 years, decrease the number of claims that they get. They also want to embed health and wellness in their culture, and they think by learning about this program, they can do that. And then, of course, um, Councillor Walters, and we also had ATB Financial, which is um, an Alberta-based, again, multi-billion dollar um, bank um, that wants to help us potentially with funding. So um, from there, we have gone back around to talk to everybody individually. Our next meeting is going to be in June, where we're going to start to look at getting letters of understanding and, and commitment. Um, people are offering in-kind space, um, possibly leaders to help run the program, and the, the private sector is looking at funding. So what we're going to be doing um, to make sure we do this right is mapping with City of Edmonton, who has been one of, become one of our major partners, Alberta Blue Cross is the other major partner, um, to look at where our most vulnerable communities are in Edmonton. So our newcomer communities, some of our lower socioeconomic communities, as well as our Indigenous children. Um, and Edmonton has the largest Indigenous population off-reserve in Alberta. So we're going to start there, but from there we're going to be developing, and we are in the middle of developing, an Indigenous plan for the province that will involve the federal government. It right now involves our public health, population public and Indigenous health. Um, and there's a lot of numbers of things that we need to do and go through. Um, the first thing is to talk to the three treaty grand chiefs um, for the territories within Alberta uh, to get, it, to get it, um, consent and, and approval and, and to work with them, to build something with them and not to be done to them in a respectful way. Um, as I said, the Premier and the Minister of Health are reviewing right now, and Alberta Health, which is the provincial government, is going to join the next round of meetings. So for us, this is a pioneering, groundbreaking piece of work in Alberta, so I have been told, because this is the first time we're going to be building a coalition in which the public sector, uh, the private sector, healthcare, charities, um, are going to be working together to bring programming to the community. And MEND is our first initiative, but we have so much more that we can do together. With all of these groups at the table, we have urban planners with Santec, looking at how we you know, provide um, even food that's zoning laws that keep groceries away from, fresh produce away from families because um, of the way that the city is zoned. All of these things are going to be looked at. So we're going to be looked at, looking at the social determinants, the environmental determinants, with our partners who have bigger reach than I do as a physician alone in my clinic or even within healthcare. So for Edmonton, the grand forecast is 495 programs, 99 a year. As you can see, the cost per child would be 1,319, but that's, that's not exactly the cost per child, that's the cost per family unit. So when you think about a lot of our parents having comorbid conditions, uh, like diabetes, and they're getting individual care, this is another way to provide that messaging in a peer sort of way, um, with lots of support um, that, that delivers that message in a, in a different way, so it can be taken up in a different way. So again, the asks were in kind, places, people, expertise, funding for cost, and who else should be at the table. So Blue Cross let us know they're going to be bringing in PCL, which is a big construction company in Alberta. And so whoever else wants to come, we're happy, happy to have them. So um, I don't know if we have any American um, colleagues in the, in the crowd, but I kind of miss this guy. And what he says is change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. 
I'm very proud to be an Edmontonian and an Albertan. Um, this is what Edmonton does. It comes together when, when people are in trouble. And so we're going to try to get this, these services to our children and, and, and move forward to the next step. Thanks, everyone. We have about four minutes for questions, so don't run away. Yes. Hi, thanks for that great inter and very interesting uh, presentation. Thank Can you. you elaborate a little bit more on what you do in MEND specifically? Sure. So it's a 10-week program. Um, the 2 to 4 and the 5 to 7 are once a week. The 7 to 13 is twice a week. They look at behavior change, goal setting, nutrition. Um, so when they piloted this program here in, in Alberta, our Alberta Health Services actually adapted the Canadian content. So it's Canadian specific, Canadian focused, and for a Canadian um, all, um, audience with cultural context. They also have an exercise component that, that runs alongside, and there's some parts that are specific to the parents that will be individual to them and where the kids do an activity. So it's really a comprehensive um, sort of multi-component program which addresses exercise, behavior change, as well as nutrition in a fun setting, which is a 10-week block, which is, I mean, it's a time commitment, but it's not a huge time commitment. So, and we found that this has been really helpful for people to understand um, when, they, when they have this material delivered to them in this sort of fun, um, energized, engaged, Canadian-adapted way, um, that the uptake has been really good. So this can be delivered by lay people. It doesn't require a health professional. They just need to be trained. And MEND has training that they run um, a few times a year, depending on what we need. And so we are able to take advantage of that. Um, lots of people who are in healthcare, lots of dietitians, psychologists, people do kind of skew toward being wanting to deliver this and volunteering to deliver this. Or, or but it, but anybody within the service delivery agency can actually um, deliver. So don't doesn't require a healthcare professional. Hi. Um, sounds very exciting for Edmonton. Um, we're, I'm from Lethbridge, so Southern <laughs> yeah. Alberta. So wondering plans to scale that to yes, areas where we're yes. also lacking in pediatric services. Yes, I, and I know you guys are. Um, so what we're hoping to do is get Edmonton running, up and running. Calgary has a little bit of programming, about eight programs. So Calgary will be, will be the next sort of thing. So we're going to try to get the city sort of up and, and going. And then we're going to have to talk to South Zone and talk about what they what they would like. We've talked to South Sound before, and they were kind of not sure if this was the right fit for them. Um, but it's, it's, it's got proven track records, so it would be something that I would go back to South Zone and talk to them about. Because we have brought it forward to them and not that long ago, um, so repeatedly. Um, and they weren't sure about, you know, uh, like if it would meet the needs. But I think we're in a place now where we can revisit that, especially if we're going to be scaling it. And then, of course, the Indigenous communities, which um, especially our First Nations communities, which fall under sort of federal jurisdiction, which, um, whichever communities want to be involved, we're going to be um, addressing those particular communities or reserves, as well as the, the um, off-reserve sort of urban um, communities. So I guess the, the short answer is I, we got to talk to South Zone again <laughs> and see if they'll, <laughs> they'll want to do this. But absolutely, my goal is to have um, province-wide services so that every child has access. Rena, I'm just going to put in a shameless plug and say that one of your partners needs to be public health. Yes. <laughs> Definitely all of those uh, structural and environmental issues, there's some expertise there. And I'll also put in a shameless plug since you brought it up. Um, Oilers are playing tonight. <laughs> Go Oilers. <laughs> I'm sure there will be a party watching somewhere. Um, okay, so our next presentation, last but certainly not least, is uh, Dr. Jeff Ball. Jeff uh, obtained his PhD in nutrition and metabolism from the University of Alberta, um, and I'm happy to say I knew him then. Um, after completing postdoctoral training in preventive medicine at the University of Southern California in LA, uh, Jeff came back north and joined the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta, and he serves as the founding director of the Pediatric Center for Weight and Health, a multidisciplinary weight management clinic at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. Welcome. sure things go well. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. I've used a laptop before.
All right, good morning, everybody. I, first off, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to present today. Um, I've got a couple disclosures, and they relate to research funding that I've received and our team has received uh, to, do, to do the work that we do. And really, it's in the form of research grants. We've also had some in-kind support from the Department of Pediatrics at the U of A in, uh, in Edmonton, as well as Alberta Health Services. And I can tell you that um, the funders have, haven't had any direct or indirect influence on what I'm going to share with you today, which is the results from some of our research. Actually, I'll do a couple things today. But before I get into the studies that uh, we've been working on, uh, we've got a, a team across the country working together. I'll talk a little bit about the magnitude and the impact of severe obesity. Um, that's in the last number of years, that seems to be emerging as a real critical issue that I think Lori and, and Rena touched on maybe a little bit directly and indirectly. Um, I'll, I'll give you a bit more of a dose of that. But the first thing I want to do, I know this is probably not uh, readable from the back of the room, but we were fortunate uh, a couple of years ago now to get a, a bariatric care team grant. So for those of you who know, there, there were three teams that were funded. We were one of three, and we were the one pediatric team. And we've got a, a, a large group of people that has been working together. In, in a lot of ways, in Edmonton, we're, we're kind of like the banker. We, ha we have the money, but people doing a lot of the work are everywhere else. Uh, we've got some work going on in Edmonton, but lots of work going on in Ontario and British Columbia, and some that are multi-center national. And we've also been fortunate, the bottom right of the slide, we've been fortunate to have a scientific advisory board beyond Canada, at, well, Suzanne Tuff from the University of Calgary, but also people, leaders in the field from other areas who've been really helpful at pushing us and helping us to think about things in a little bit different way. So the reason uh, to, to do the grant in the beginning, the reason I think we were funded was because we had a couple key areas that we decided to identify. And one was understanding severe obesity in children a bit more, and the other one was De uh, developing and testing novel interventions related to managing severe obesity. And I'll just show you here, we've got a number of studies that we have proposed and we've actually added to this list over time. I'm not going to go over everything today, um, but I can tell you that of the eight studies we've got going, seven of them have ethics approval, so we're already going in a lot of ways, um, started in a lot of ways. Some projects are coming to an end, some are midway, and some are yet to launch. But today I'm going to talk about three of them. So within the, this group, we've got a bit of epidemiology, some qualitative work, some surveillance, uh, secondary data analyses from the CANPOWER study. So some of you might know CANPOWER is the Canadian Pediatric Weight Management Registry. It's led by Catherine Morris in, in Hamilton, but there's, a, you know, there's 10, I think 10 or 11 sites across the country participating. So it's a, one of those multi-center projects that's helpful to bring us all together. And in a lot of ways, what we work on clinically, and I think what Rena and Lori can attest to as well in their clinical work is most of the families that we see at our clinics, and these are multidisciplinary uh, family-oriented programs, are boys and girls have severe obesity. And to set the stage a little bit, I want to provide some context. And we know in adults that, I mean, if for you, for those of you who've been in the field for a while, you know that this has been well, you know, this is well uh, understood or well appreciated, and I think for quite a while. There's been clear definitions of severe obesity in adults, but of course, pediatrics is a slightly different world. There's a general agreement on the metrics, so we use BMI, and you can argue and quibble about whether it's a good individual um, measure at the, at the patient level or at the child level. Um, there's obviously, well, there's work within our team grant. We're looking at beyond BMI to look at the four M's, and I think Lori touched on it today about the, the broader influences of health. It's not just about weight, of course, it's about uh, lots of other things. But in terms of defining severe obesity, there's work to be done, and I think that was one of the reasons why we were funded is because you can see here the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have a couple different definitions that they've used over time. I'd say the, the percentiles, it's always a bit of a mouthful, but the class two and the class three obesity, when, when they define it as 120% of the 95th percentile, it's always a little bit to sort of get your head around and I'll show you a, a growth chart that might help provide some context. The World Health Organization, which is the, the reference that we use in Canada, which is tweaked by the Canadian Pediatric uh, Endocrine Group. Um, we have those uh, growth charts that we use in Canada, but you can see that there are different definitions used even within that one reference. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And, um, but to provide some context, this is a growth chart. This is the CDC growth chart on the x-axis is age, on the y-axis on the left is absolute BMI, and then on the right y-axis is percentile. So you can see 
the percentiles range from 5% at the bottom to 95% at the top. And this is an example of one girl who was plotted, there be, her BMI was plotted over time. So these are multiple measurements of the same individual over time. And you can see as she's getting older, that, that BMI percentile is going higher and higher, and it basically reaches the top. And when you get to the top, it, you, there's nowhere else to go. And this is not unusual. A lot of the kids that we see in our clinics, this is what they would look like if you were to map them. And that's a problem clinically because where that circle is at the top, there's no uh, real good resolution to know what's actually happening. Is it really flat? Is it potentially increasing or is it even decreasing at that extreme point? And we really don't know based on how we've defined obesity historically, which has been a BMI greater than the 95th percentile. But what the CDC has done is expand that category of boys and girls above the, 80, above the 95th percentile. So a couple slides previous, I showed you the 120% of the 95th percentile and 140% of the 95th percentile. So this is what it looks like when you factor in those, uh, those categories above the 95th percentile. This is the same girl, same measurements, but plotted with a different growth, different uh, chart that provides more resolution at the top. So still at the bottom there, there's the, I think on this example, there's the 10 percentile, 25, 50, and then where it's getting up into the top part, that's where it's 110% of the 95th, 120% of the 95th. So it just shows you that she actually was indeed increasing over time. And there were some little blips here and there where it sort of plateaued, but then it continued to increase. But that resolution wouldn't be provided if we use the old school CDC growth charts. So this is just showing you clinical relevance or clinical application of that. And beyond the clinical, from a, a research perspective, there have been a few people who've been leading the field, and I'd say Ashley Skinner from North Carolina, as well as Joey Skelton, and Joey's one of our scientific, uh, external scientific advisors for our team, our team grant. They've done some work related to the prevalence of severe obesity in American kids, and we're limited in Canada. The, for those of you who know, there's a couple uh, longitudinal, there's a couple national studies, the, the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, the Canadian Health Measure Survey, those are are not adequate for us to really get at the issue of severe obesity in kids just because they were never designed to look at that. But in the States, they have the National Health, National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys, which have been going on for decades. So they've got a nice, rich data source. And this is, they've got a lot of data in that one paper, but this is the one chart that shows the temporal trend over time. So on the far left is, I think, 1999 to 2000, and on the far right is 2013 and 2014. Mm -hmm. And this just shows that that top line is class one obesity. So these are all the kids above the 95th percentile. And there's that 120% of the 95th and 140% of the 95th. So this is one of the first reports to show that severe obesity, regardless of how you define it, tends to be increasing over time. So there's a linear trend there. And it's fairly consistent across genders, across ethnicities. Um, so it seems to be, although quantitatively small, we're only talking two to three to four, maybe up to 6%. But we know that the, the issues that a lot of these kids are facing and a lot of the families are facing are really challenging. And that's where the burden and that's where the work at the healthcare system comes into play. Before that paper, uh, Ashley and Joey, they also published a paper in the New England Journal. And they were looking at not just about, not just obesity, but also what does that mean in terms of risk factors. So they did what a lot of us do clinically. They looked at a number of different measures related to lipids and blood pressure and things like that. And you can see the different variables here and the sample sizes. So these are th 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 in the thousands of kids across the country. And uh, along the bottom, the x-axis there, these are the, these are the typical risk factors we look at from lipids and blood pressure, um, glucose. And then as the bars get darker in color, that's the increasing uh, weight categories. And you can see it's fairly consistent as the weight categories go across, the prevalence of these cardiometabolic risk factors tends to increase. And we have one uh, smaller study that we did a couple years ago with kids from our clinic at the, at the Stollery Children's Hospital. This is about 350 boys and girls. And this chart is quite similar to the one I showed you previously. The dark bars are the kids with severe obesity. The lighter bars are those boys and girls just with overweight or obesity. And you can see here a fairly consistent pattern with those boys and girls. In the dark bars, they are more, the, the prevalence of cardiometabolic risk is higher in that group, highlighting that they're, you know, there are, they are at some increased risk. And I know this is difficult to see, but I just wanted to point out a couple things. We also looked at lifestyle habits, and you can quibble about methods regarding how you assess diet and physical activity. You know, a lot of us know that we usually look at this with a grain of salt or a shaker of salt, depending on how you think about it. But within these groups, we found both 
from a dietary perspective and from a physical activity perspective. Those boys and girls in the severe obese category were less physically active and, and their dietary habits were of poorer quality. So highlighting that it's not just about the weight, but it's about some of the things they may be doing that they uh, suggest there may be additional support or, or special attention needed in that regard. So that's a bit of context for you uh, of, of the work to date. And what I wanted to do now is to highlight a couple of the studies that we're working on. Um, Catherine Birkin has led some research uh, from Ontario, and, I, and she's not here, so I can tell you that Sarah Carsey, who's at the back of the room, has done pretty much all the work. <laughs> and uh, so you should get some credit, Sarah, for all of that. And she's presenting in more detail on Friday. Um, I forget the time, but please look in your calendar, but I know she's, she's going to share in a bit more detail. She was kind enough to share a couple slides with me to give you a teaser. So there's a, a couple, I think th these are two of the three databases they're looking at in terms of severe obesity. I mentioned before we don't have good national data, but provincially in Ontario, actually pretty good data. So from their target kids group, which is a, a consortium of primary care clinics who are participating in research, and I believe younger, the, the focus is on younger children up to five years of age. And they also have electronic medical records through Emerald, which is uh, more inclusive of a broader range, and you can see the sample sizes there. So pretty good numbers with which to work. And then here on the left is the target kids, and on the right is the Emerald data. And the, the top few rows are probably the, the, the take-home message here because it's, she's, it's broken down by gender as well. But you can see the prevalence here using a different classification system than I reported, than I shared previously, which is, was done in the U.S. This is using the WHO uh, definition using BMIZ score, and you can see 2% of, of boys and girls in that in that youngest category met the definition. And then for Emerald, you can see that the, the prevalence tends to increase as boys and girls are getting older from 2.7 to 3 to 3.9. So as far as we know, this is the, the only data we have on severe obesity prevalence from a large sample of kids within the country and specifically within Ontario. So the next step I know for Sarah, uh, she's uh, busy with the next step looking at not just prevalence, but what does that mean? Are those kids who are in that severe obese category, do they have increased medical costs? Are they, are they accessing services more or less? And we've got some data to say it, may, it might be less, and uh, we can maybe talk about that uh, with some questions afterwards. But they're also looking at other issues related to the time period that's most meaningful to do that measurement. The other study that I'm going to talk about is, an, is one that is just finishing, and uh, I'm the lead for it, but the person who did most of the work is also in the room, uh, Arnaldo Perez, who just defended his PhD a couple days ago. Um, so I'll try to do it justice, Arnaldo. And, and one of the other things I wanted to point out with our team grant is we had a group of people that was about 25 or 30 to begin with, but then of course as projects get going, people sort of come and go and, and we were um, fortunate and I, I guess ple very pleased to have other people come on board. So these are data that I'll, sh I'll talk about from Alberta Health Services. So a lot of the people at the bottom here were added after the team grant, but they play an integral role within AHS and within the university to help with analyses and access to data and those things. So I, I, I talked a little bit before about multidisciplinary care, and we know that the care can be effective. It, it often is not effective, but there's evidence to, to say that there's effectiveness data related to managing obesity. But I'd say the focus historically has been on attrition. And if anyone who works in the area, you know, whether you're working as an outpatient dietitian or a part of a team, families come, individuals come, but they often drop away. And they often drop away prematurely, or maybe might meet their needs, but maybe earlier than you would like them to or think they, think they should. Um, and there's a growing body of literature around that, but there's comparatively very little around initiation, and I'll present you with some data today that hopefully suggests that initiation or engagement is probably a, a more uh, important step. Within this study, we wanted to look at two primary things, the proportion of boys and girls who were referred for care within Alberta for weight management and the predictors of enrollment. So what were the things that predicted whether they would actually initiate care? So as a cross-sectional study, we included boys and girls from across the age range who were referred for multidisciplinary weight management care between 2013 and 2016. And as Rena talked about, we do have a, there's a lot of advantages of having an integrated system. And I would say from a selfish researcher perspective to have access to data, all the researchers out there will you know, get what I'm talking about. That's a really nice feature. It's, it's um, sometimes overlooked, but it's invaluable and it does give insight into some processes that are important. I'm gonna cut to the chase. So. Over that time frame, there were just over 2,000 boys and girls referred for weight management in Alberta. And one of the things I want to highlight is that this is the population. This is not a sample of it. This is everybody who was referred 
over that time frame. And from those 2,000 boys and girls, there were 80, roughly 82% booked in orientation sessions. So this is a, a group-based, usually done on a monthly basis. Families are referred, they come and learn about the program, ask some questions, maybe get a tour. After that point, they, so they, they book into it, and then the next step is they actually attend. And you can see there's a drop-off between the booked and the attend. So it's around 56% of those kids who were referred actually attend a preclinical orientation session. And then for those who attend, there's an initial appointment that's booked, and then you can see the proportion of boys and girls who actually attended, which in our case is around 38%. So the flip side of, of it is more than 60% of boys and girls who are referred for care never make it to the clinic. And when you think about attrition, maybe it's 30%, 40%, that, that's a smaller, you know, there's smaller drops in the pail compared to the, the lack of engagement we have right off the bat. And we've got quite a bit of regression modeling stuff that I could bore you with for a while. Um, but I'm going to cut to the chase with three quick points. There were three predictors of initiation. One was severe obesity. So in our sample, we found that those boys and girls who were most severely obese or met, were at the highest uh, degree of severe obesity were less likely to engage in care, which is kind of counter to what you would think, right? You think, well, maybe they, you know, these are boys and girls who are bigger. Maybe there are more health risks. They, they might benefit most from care. Well, in our example, they were, least, they were the less, less likely to engage. The other thing we found, and I was talking to Lori about this earlier today, about wait times and wait lists, and we found that the longer that wait time, the, more, the less likely families were to initiate care. And the other thing that we found, we, I mentioned before, we, had, we actually have three sites, as Rena mentioned, within the, the province, two in Edmonton, one in Calgary, and clinic site mattered. And there are details that I won't have time to get into today, but our clinics are, in general, run the same way philosophically, but operationally there are differences, and those differences were reflected in the ability for families to initiate care. Um, so, so both individual level variables, so severe obesity, as well as bigger picture contextual variables. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, light, and this is uh, a project that Louise Mass is leading from UBC. It's one of our multi-center um, intervention studies around managing and you might have seen a couple days ago where our federal health minister announced thank you announced uh, funding from public health agency of canada but it includes funding from a, a number of different sources uh, this is going to be uh, an app and we had a dinner meeting last night and it was interesting to to sit with uh, mavis who's from iogo which is a, a software development company in vancouver talk about all the functionality and it's this language that is you know foreign to <laughs> most of us a lot of us uh, but the, the, the link, the, the value that there's going to be there to actually work with families through our clinics and, and our team grant is really just a, a part of it. So we've got some money built into our team grant to evaluate the effectiveness of it with kids with severe obesity, but there's lots of other things that are, are developing over the coming years. So it's a very exciting initiative um, for boys and girls and for families. Um, so if anyone would like more information about it, Janice McDonald, who is the program director, is here in the audience. Do you want to just raise your hand, Janice, just so people know? So you can, you can pepper her with questions to get more information. I know they've got a lot of good information on their website, too. Tom Warshawski, who's also here, has been really pioneering that initiative for, for a number of years. So it's great to see it get to that point, and we're really excited about helping to evaluate it. So with that, I'm going to end. We've got a, a, a blog which we use to keep our team up to date on things related to to our, uh, our team grant because, of course, we're spread out across the country, but it's also, uh, if anyone's interested in severe obesity, interested in the projects we're doing, interested in participating in some capacity, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we are right at 11 o'clock, so we don't have time for questions, so you might have to grab him, not literally. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but there is another session starting in here right away at Pecha Kucha. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, if you're interested, please stay for the Pecha Kucha session. And uh, a reminder that there is lunch across in the convention center um, at noon and uh, sessions this afternoon. Don't forget to do your evaluation. Thank you.
If everyone could please take a seat, we're going to get started with the Pecha Kucha. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Pecha Kucha sessions uh, for track two. My name is Alexa Ferdinand, and I'll be moderating the session today. To start things off, it's my pleasure to introduce our judges, uh, Drs. Kim Rain, Jeff Ball, and Stasha Hadjianakis. On behalf of the Canadian Obesity Network, I'd like to thank you uh, for providing us with your time and fair judgment today. Feature Pecha Kucha presenters for the 2017 Canadian Obesity Summit represent the top scoring abstracts. Prizes will be awarded to the best presentations at the summit closing ceremony on Friday, April 28th at 4.30 p.m. For our speakers, as you know, you have 20 seconds uh, per slide and the slides will advance automatically. I'll announce your name and title of the presentation and then your time will begin. Unless there's time at the end, there will be no question period during, but please feel free to approach the presenters at the end of the session. So, um, I'll begin by uh, calling out our first presenter to the podium, Alisa Kakanami, who will be presenting a systematic review and meta-analysis of weight loss intentions and strategy use among youth. Good morning, everyone. Can, hear, can people hear me okay in the back? Okay, thanks so much for the opportunity to present some of my research today. Is there a first slide here? Okay, great. So on behalf of my study co-author, I'm happy to present some of our systematic review results on whether there are sex differences in weight loss intentions and also weight loss behaviors that also persist across demographic and health characteristics in youth. And I'm presenting on behalf of Stephanie Hull Johnson from the University of Ottawa. So as we all know, the prevalence of youth with either overweight or obesity tends to be higher in those who are teens and adolescents compared to those who are younger age children. And this phenomenon is seen as both uh, North American populations in the US as well as in Canada. And in fact, approximately 50% of all youth are report currently trying to lose weight. Unfortunately, out of those 50%, less than half of them will be successful. The other half either failed to lose weight in the first place or will regain that weight fairly quickly. And so given these fairly high prevalence rates, we felt it's important to improve our understanding of how children and youth are self-managing their weight and their weight loss intentions. And so while in our heads we know from the literature that the approaches to getting healthy weight loss is the same as approaches for healthy, healthy lifestyles, including consumption of fruits and vegetables, physical activity, and decreased consumption of sugars, fats, and saturated fats and calories, we realize that in reality this is probably not the case for all youth. And in fact, while these are healthy strategies, they do, are, do take a little bit longer because they are more of a gradual process. And so in reality, children are probably using, in combination with those healthy behaviors, some more unhealthy and extreme behaviors, such as skipping meals, taking diet pills or laxatives in order to try to lose weight more quickly. And in fact, we know from adult population that compared to men, women tend to be more likely to try to lose weight and also tend to be more likely to use some of those unhealthy behaviors such as skipping meals and taking diet pills to lose weight. However, what's not clear is whether these sex differences persist in youth populations, and in particular for the youth populations, whether these sex differences persist across different age categories, across elementary, middle school, and high school, based on different race ethnicities, and also based on weight status. And so the objective of this study was to conduct a systematic review on assessing whether these sex differences continue to persist in youth populations across these demographic and health characteristics, as well as based on their weight loss strategies. Whenever possible, we tried to also do a meta-analysis, which I'll talk about in a few slides as well. In order for the study to be included in our systematic review and meta-analysis, there were several inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria included that it need to be conducted in a youth population less than 18 years of age, to be published between 1990 and 2015, uh, written in English and also conducted in North American populations such as Canada or the US. Our main exclusion criteria included a uh, focus group of qualitative data, studies which were intervention studies, and also studies which did not separate out or distinguish between children who are trying to lose weight compared to those who are trying to maintain weight loss. So out of the initial 3,300 studies that we found from our search terminology, after we assessed them based on eligibility criteria and inclusion exclusion criteria, we were left with approximately 19 studies for a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, overall, when we look at just the prevalence rates of weight loss intentions and also weight loss strategies in the youth female populations compared to the male youth populations, 
we see a very large range in their intentions and also their behaviors to the point where we really can't really make any kind of conclusions on whether there continues to be a sex difference between females and males. Uh, so for the next few slides, we'll look more at the meta-analysis, which gives us a little bit more conclusive evidence. So when we look at, in general, compared to men, the women in our meta-analysis, which was only in eight studies, we found that the women were approximately uh, 2.8, <laughs> as soon as that slide advances, were about 2.8 times more likely to try to lose weight compared to men. I don't think this slide is advancing. This one is. So in those studies which did assess for sex differences, we were able to see that compared to men, although some studies had a, a fairly large range in terms of the sex difference, on average women were about 2.8 times more likely compared to their male uh, youth counterparts to try to lose weight. But when we assessed these based on uh, different demographic and health characteristics, we found this not to be consistent across all levels. So for instance, for the youngest children in elementary school, there was no noticeable sex difference for weight loss intentions between men versus women. Uh, but by the time the youth were in either middle school or high school, they were between two and three times more likely to try to lose weight compared to their male counterparts. Uh, based on race ethnicity, we also found that Native American females were not more likely to try to lose weight compared to the Native American males. But Native American, uh, I'm sorry, African American and Caucasian females were sin significantly more likely to try to lose weight compared to their male counterparts. Unfortunately, we did not have enough studies to look at whether there was a sex difference based on um, their weight status categories, but we did see that in general, only the youth who perceived themselves to be either overweight or with obesity were significantly more likely to try to lose weight compared to the, the females and males who were actually measured as having overweight or obesity. In terms of, that's okay, thank you. In terms of looking at the different uh, weight loss strategies, we found no sex difference in some healthy strategies such as exercise in order to try to lose weight. But compared to males, the female participants were more likely to report using smaller portions in order to lose weight. When we looked at more unhealthy behaviors, um, such as fasting or skipping meals, we found that, again, there was not a consistent sex difference. In particular, uh, females were not more likely to fast in order to lose weight compared to males, but the females were about 2.2 2 .2 times more likely to skip meals in order to lose weight compared to males. And lastly, for the most extreme behaviors which we consider to be the most unhealthy, such as using diet pills or diuretics or laxatives in order to try to lose weight, we found significant sex differences for all of these most extreme behaviors, such that females were about one to two and a half times more likely to use these strategies in order to lose weight compared to males. So in summary, we found uh, some, some sex differences that were noticeable. Uh, across different demographic health characteristics and also based on different weight loss strategies, but these were not consistent across all these different characteristics. And so it, this suggests to us that, for one thing, that while we have some general evidence that females are more likely to do some behaviors compared to males, this is not a blanket statement, and so we really do need some more research on this. The main limitation of the study was, although we started out with a very large pool of studies, we only ended up using 19 studies that met our inclusion-exclusion criteria. And we also found some significant heterogeneity in the way some of these weight loss intentions and strategies were being measured. Um, one of the main strengths of the study was that we were able to focus on children trying to lose weight rather than grouping them together with those who are trying to lose or maintain weight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Maha Al Saif, who will be presenting fasting and postprandial glucose insulin and glucagon-like peptide one levels in children with Prader-Willi syndrome. So thank you for the introduction. So many of us are here just Many of us are here just having enough protein in their diet to prevent deficiency. However, in certain cases, some people would, would benefit much higher protein intake in their diet. The studies have shown that high protein diets are able to increase satiety hormones, decrease hunger, improve weight loss, and glycemic control. 
So Bradley's syndrome is genetic model of severe childhood obesity associated with higher insulin sensitivity and higher adiponectin levels compared to similar BMI. And it's also associated with altered neuroendocrine dysfunction. So it has been shown that this neuroendocrine dysfunction, uh, macronutrient composition can impact this neuroendocrine di difference, he's suggesting that dietary protein can play an important role in glycemic control, and also can stimulate GLP-1 secretion. However, we don't know if GLP-1 alter in children with the Woody syndrome. So therefore, the purpose of this study was to examine the high protein meal and fasting and bisabrandial glucose, insulin, GLP-1 response in children with the Prader-Willi syndrome and compare them to children without the syndrome. So for our recruitment, children with the Prader-Willi syndrome were recruited from the endocrinology clinic at the Story Children Hospital and control were primary sibling of Prader-Willi Prader syndrome participant. Each participant completed the three different study visits and weight and height were measured at each study visit. So at each study visit, participants arrived following an overnight fast and received controlled diet contained 15% total energy from protein and two higher protein diets contained 30% of total energy from protein in random order. So then when we looked at their blood levels, we collected the blood level at fasting at one, two, three hours following the meal. And that was in every single study th for three times. Then we analyzed the blood samples using enzyme immunosay to compare between fasting and postprandial between um, Prader-Willi syndrome and control group. So when our view of our characteristic of the participants, age, BMI, and percent body fat were comparable between Prader-Willi syndrome and control group. However, we had more female in the Prader-Willi syndrome group and more male in our control group. So when we looked at our patient characteristics, uh, so for the fasting blood result, Prader-Willi syndrome had lower fasting glucose and showed a trend to lower fasting coma and insulin, be insulin at um, baseline compared to control group. However, GLB-1 were comparable between Prader-Willi syndrome and control group. So when we looked at postprandial results, we calculated area under curve, taking into account area above and below the fasting levels for the total of three hours. And we also compared between the meal within a group based on the total area under curve as well. So following the consumption of control diet, Glucose increased in a Prader-Willi syndrome group of, uh, based on the total area under curve for three hours compared to control group. And postprandial glucose and level relative to fasting was higher in the Prader-Willi syndrome group at three hours following the meal ingestion compared to control group. And a, a similar pattern uh, of glucose response occurred following the two higher protein meals. And when we looked at the area under curve to compare our three meals, we did not find any significant difference between the three meals. So following the consumption of standard diet as well, we found that uh, postprandial insulin increased over time in both Prader-Willi syndrome and control group based on the total area under curve for three hours. So and postprandial level of insulin relative to fasting level was higher in Prader-Willi syndrome group at one, two, three hours following the meal compared to control group. Then when we looked at the area under curve to compare between the three meals, we found that insulin increased um, in high protein, low fat diet compared to high protein, low carb diet in Prader-Willi syndrome group only. And we did not find any significant difference between the response between the three meals. So following the consumption of the standard diet, Glucose level increase, slightly increased in Prader-Willi syndrome group compared to control group. So when we looked at the peak time to see if there's any difference between the peak time between the two group, we did not find any significant difference between the, the peak time. So, and actually it's in agreement with our finding from glucose results, a similar pattern occurred following the two higher protein meals. And when we looked at the area under curve to compare our three meals, we did not find any significant difference between the three meals. 
So the prolonged insulin and glucose response in a Prader-Willi syndrome are suggestive mm -hmm. to delayed gastric emptying that has been reported in children with a Prader-Willi syndrome. And another possibility could be to lower tissue uptake of glucose due to lower muscle mass. So <coughs> the impact of macronutrient composition on postprandial metabolism required further study. As the differences between protein content in meal used in this study may not have been large enough or given enough duration to induce change in postprandial metabolism. So <coughs> the strength of our study is in fault of the study design chosen to evaluate the, the variable just described, which is randomized control crossover study design, and also the use of two higher protein meals to determine of the impact of high of the protein effect due to their reduction in fat or reduction in carbohydrate. So I would like to thank my supervisors, I think they are both in here, my lab group and our funders, Alberta Diabetes Institute, Women and, Health, uh, Women and Children Health Research Institute, and Saudi Arabian Culture Bureau. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paolo Luca, who will be presenting prevalence of comorbid conditions pre-existing and diagnosed at tertiary care pediatric weight management clinic. Good morning. My name is Paula Luca, and I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary. And today I'll be presenting the results of a study where we looked at the prevalence of comorbid conditions in our tertiary care pediatric weight management clinic in Calgary. As you know, there are multiple sequelae of childhood obesity, ranging from cardiovascular to endocrine to musculoskeletal, renal, GI, and respiratory, as well as significant psychosocial concerns, including poor self-esteem and depression. The Pediatric Center for Weight and Health in Calgary and Alberta is a multidisciplinary clinic that focuses on the health of children 2 to 17 years of age with a BMI greater than the 85th percentile. We provide family-centered care, and our goal is to, to help families make small, sustainable, healthy changes. The aim of our study was to look at the prevalence of obesity-related comorbid conditions um, present in our patients prior to attending our clinic and within 12 months of being in our clinic. We completed a cross-sectional retrospective chart review from May 2012 to May 2014. We looked at 199 patients who were assessed by a physician and their average age was 12 years, 50% were male, and the average BMI was 30.6 with the Z-score of 2.7 and percentile of 98.5. This slide shows the prevalence of comorbid conditions present in our patients. The most common comorbidity diagnosed was dyslipidemia in just over 50%, followed by asthma in about one quarter, and fatty liver disease in about 16%. We found concerns of depression and anxiety in 10 and 13% of our patients respectively. We diagnosed hypertension, prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes in a small number of patients, and we did not find any patients had a complaint of slip capital femoral epiphysis or SCIFI. About 10% had sleep apnea or PCOS. Of the 48 patients with dyslipidemia, the most common abnormality was high triglycerides in 54%, followed by low HDL in 48%, high non-HDL in 35%, and high LDL in 25%. When we look at comorbidities by age, we found that youth greater than 10 years of age accounted for the diagnosis in the majority of cases. For example, youth who were older than 10 years accounted for the diagnosis of hypertension in 83% of cases, pre-diabetes in 91%, and type 2 diabetes in 100%. And we found the same results when we looked at dyslipidemia, fatty liver, asthma, sleep apnea, PCOS, and concerns of depression or anxiety. The 
the majority of comorbidities were diagnosed prior to joining our clinic. This was true except in the case of prediabetes, diabetes, and PCOS. A diagnosis was considered to be pre-existing if it was listed in the initial consult note as a known diagnosis, or if it was diagnosed on blood work drawn more than one month prior to the initial nursing visit. And so our results suggest that primary care providers are screening their patients who are overweight or obese for these comorbidities, which is a positive sign. When diagnoses were made in our clinic, they were most commonly made within the first three months of seeing one of our team members, except in the case of hypertension, asthma, and sleep apnea, which are conditions that often require more extensive investigations and more time to diagnose. So as a recap, the most common conditions found in our patients were dyslipidemia in 53%, asthma in 23%, and fatty liver disease in 16%. And youth greater than 10 years of age accounted for the diagnosis in the majority of cases, emphasizing the importance of screening this age population um, for these conditions. So how does this compare to the literature? Our rates of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes were lower than those reported. However, our patients have a lower BMI compared to other studies, and we selectively screen with an oral glucose tolerance test. Our rates of hypertension and dyslipidemia were similar to other large studies. Similar, similarly, our rates of fatty liver were similar to those in the literature. While we did not find any reports of SCIFI, other studies that have looked at a broad range of orthopedic concerns such as genuvalgum, flat feet, or hyperlordosis have found these conditions to be more common, with one study showing up to 53% had one of these complaints. Similarly, if if um, studies look at a broad variety of psychological complaints, the rates are much higher. For example, um, if we look at bullying, uh, studies show that up to 40% of youth attending an obesity clinic will report bullying at school or at home. So the results of our study provide more information of obesity-related comorbidities in overweight and obese youth, particularly on a local level. And they emphasize the importance of screening our patients for these conditions, particularly if they're 10 years of age or older, and having the resources available um, to provide treatment, including an experienced multidisciplinary team to support the patients and their families through the treatment process. I'd like to acknowledge the other team members who were involved in this project, um, including Dr. Josephine Ho, who's the medical lead of the Pediatric Center for Weight and Health in Calgary, as well as Michelle Jackman, um, who is the pediatrician in the clinic, Dr. Griselle Leon, Dr. Elizabeth DeClerc, Dr. Raylene Reimer, and Kimberly Connors, as well as the PCWH team and families. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker will be Susan Pinkney, and she'll be presenting on the Live 5210 Family Physician Toolkit for Promoting Healthy Childhood Behaviors in Primary Care, a pilot study. Thank you. So I'm Susan Pinkney. I'm the Provincial Project Manager for SCOPE and Live 5210. We're a community-based childhood obesity prevention initiative based out of BC Children's Hospital. I'm going to be presenting on a small pilot study that we did on this family physician toolkit for promoting healthy behaviors in children in primary care. But before that, I'll give you some context and background for the work that we do and how we came to be doing community-based prevention. So our initiative was started by a pediatric endocrinologist at BC Children's who was interested in the management of children and youth with type 2 diabetes. During her fellowship, she carried out a study that looked at all children and youth diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the point of diagnosis. What she found was that at the point of diagnosis, no children or youth had healthy weights, 95% were classified as obese, and really shockingly, 38% uh, already had at least one complication, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or kidney disease at the point of diagnosis. What this highlighted for us was the need for effective prevention to work on making change at the community level to prevent this serious outcome. However, we know that the causal factors for childhood obesity are notoriously complex. This is the UK's Foresight Obesity Systems Map, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It illustrates how many different interdependent factors 
influence the, the development of childhood obesity. Because of this, we know that effective prevention must try to address the complexity by not focusing on one particular aspect, but across as many of these influencing layers as possible. These layers can include um, family dynamics of an individual, community layers such as access to food or physical activity, um, and all other influencing factors at the level of the community. So our initiative takes this multi-sectoral community-based approach where we try to influence child behaviors across every sector of a community. We launched in 2009, partnering with two communities in BC, and we now have 12 par partner communities across the province. When we first started this work with our pilot communities, one main priority that our communities identified was the need for a common consistent message that could be used by all partners across a community. What was identified was the Lib 5210 message that stands for at least five vegetables or fruits each day, no more than two hours of screen time, at least one hour of active play, and zero sugary drinks. What's important though is not only sharing a consistent message across the community to raise knowledge and awareness, but also for all community sectors to take action to make change to practices, policies, and environments to actually support children in, in living these behaviors. We've had multiple sectors across different communities come up with ideas for this support, and this uh, intervention that I'm gonna talk about really looked at what the health sector can do to help uh, share and support Live 5210 with family physicians. So we developed the Live 5210 Family Physician Toolkit in partnership with the Chilliwack Division of Family Practice, which is our local organizational partner. We wanted to enhance family physicians' capacity to routinely measure BMI, promote healthy behaviors, increase the number of family physicians promoting health, and identify the barriers and, and facilitators to implementation. The first round of the pilot study took place in five primary care clinics across, across Chilliwack over six months with 12 family physicians and their office staff participating. We then conducted the second pilot round in, with the East Kidney Division of Family Practice in Kimberley. These pilots occurred sequentially with the Kimberley round beginning after the conclusion of the Chilliwack round. There was one small um, adaptation made in Kimberley, which was the use of a BMI self-care station to address some barriers that were uh, indicated in the Chilliwack portion. The toolkit was comprised of a number of materials to support family physicians in screening and documenting BMI, assessing healthy lifestyles, respectful discussion of health and weight, and behavior recommendations based on Live 5210. Resources included a healthy habits questionnaire, an assessment and management flow chart, uh, Live 5210 prescription pad, as well as posters and different materials to help share the message. Implementation also included training sessions provided by some specialists from BC Children's Hospital on uh, measuring and assessing BMI, weight bias and respectful language, motivational interviewing, and use of the toolkit elements. Our data collection included pre and post surveys of all physicians before and after, as well as some qualitative interviews. So our findings found that overall, the toolkit helped to increase physician knowledge. Physicians reported increased knowledge of medical evaluation of obese pediatric patients, increasing from 14 to 36%, which was still quite small. Surveys also indicated a large increase in knowledge of behavioral goal setting, and as well as a high level, sorry, uh, and in motivational interviewing. In terms of perceived e efficacy, we saw improvements in addressing weight and health behaviors across weight, nutrition, screen time, physical activity, and sugary drinks. And we also saw quite a bit of improvement in assessing patients' readiness and confidence in their ability to change. When it comes to actual practice change, routine promotion of healthy behaviors increased. It was reported that this was facilitated by the use of the message. Uh, the biggest change was in addressing screen time, which rose from 14 to 64% and physical activity, sugary drinks, and nutrition also rose. Um, in terms of percentage of family physicians that routinely measure BMI, <clears throat> this was really interesting. In spite of some increases in beliefs around the importance, we really didn't see too much change. With all pediatric patients, measurement of BMI only rose from seven to 29%, and in the subset of obese pediatric patients, it only rose from um, 29 to 50%, so still only half. The feasibility of BMI measurement was, was um, reported to be one of the biggest barriers to implementation, mostly because of the capacity of front-end staff who are relied upon to measure BMI, and the implementation of the BMI self-care station didn't make as much of a difference as we thought that it would. In terms of facilitators, the ease of the Live 5210 message and the ready-made resources were the biggest facilitator. 
So in conclusion, um, we did see some positive benefits. There are barriers that remain to be addressed, which we'll continue to work on. We're hoping to refine it and roll it out further across the province. We also have um, a follow-on project that we're just beginning to implement, which is the development and piloting of a related toolkit for pediatric subspecialty clinics at BC Children's Hospital. We're just beginning that work and it'll roll out. So thank you for listening. If you're interested in looking at the resources, they're available on our Live 5 2 and 0 website under the health sector resources there. Thank you. All right, so thank you to everyone for presenting and let's all give our presenters a round of applause. So best overall presentations will be announced at the closing ceremonies on Friday, April 28th at 4.30 p.m. And lunch is now served in Van Horn uh, for the buffet lunch or Riverview Cascade for the box lunch. Thank you.